ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, um, for your delectation and delight. I am John Atak, which everybody knows, and this is Spike Robinson, which everybody else knows. Um, yeah, work on that one. And um, yeah, we have a topic and um, topic is something like, how do you know that you've got out of Scientology? Because walking out of the door and saying, I no longer belong to that group, and the word belong is relevant here, I no longer belong to that group, doesn't mean that what you believe has now evaporated. In the words of um, Leah Remini, uh, you can take the girl out of Scientology, but you can't take Scientology out of the girl. Now, I disagree. Um, you can. So I, I wrote to Leah Remini before the Aftermath show broadcast um, because of Troublemaker and with the offer of taking Scientology out of the girl. And I got a very nice whole page handwritten orthographic handwritten letter back. And I'm not sure what happened after that, but I think there is a kind of presumption that if you just sort of battle with it long enough, you'll get over it. Now, okay. Long before that book was written, a book called The Mindbenders was written by a man called Cyril Vosper. Cyril spent 14 years in Scientology. He knew her, but he was on advanced clinical courses in the 50s and 60s. He used to see Hubbard at St. Hill. And uh, he was, in fact, one of the subjects for a book called Have You Lived Before This Life? And if, like me, you've got a copy of the first edition, you'll see the name Cyril Vosper as one of the pre-clears and one of the auditors in that sequence. A uh, sequence that led to that highly amusing book, Have You Lived Before This Life? Um, those names were all taken out, and I think probably most of the people who uh, whose work was included in Have You Lived Before This Life, their names were taken out because they would, of course, subsequently, as with Cyril, be declared suppressive persons. Or is that suppressive people? I don't know. In the plural, could be. I thought SP meant social personality whereas antisocial personality was ASP, but obviously had that wrong. So Cyril, in 1983, when I left Scientology, I still believed, and I left because I still believed at the end of 1983, and I, st I started on this quest. I, I contacted my friend Ira Chayla because I'd refused to disconnect from him, which is what I was asked to do, and I said, Ira, introduce me to the suppressive people. I want to talk to them because... I don't trust what I'm being told anymore. And I knew that he had been declared suppressive for being called Ira Chalo. <laughs> there, was, there was no uh, bill of particulars. There was no court of ethics or committee of evidence. There was nothing followed policy. And I'd spent six months complaining to here, there, and everywhere through the Continental Justice Chief and the International Justice Chief, and eventually to L. Ron Hubbard, because you could still write to L. Ron Hubbard back then. And um, I wrote a letter that said, uh, I know that L. Ron Hubbard does not receive his letters, but this is the last recourse. And I got a, a letter back that said, of course I received my letters. <laughs> it's great. I don't believe this nonsense. And so I, I got hold of Iron and said, look, introduce me to some of these suppressives, because maybe they can tell me what on earth has been going on. And they were delightful people, generally. The, the few that I met at that time. And Cyril Vosper's name came up. Now, Cyril had a bestseller. He sold 100,000 copies of The Mindbenders in the late 1960s. And uh, 108,000, I think, was the total, which is pretty good going. And it's quite an interesting book. Um, but when I contacted him, I, I said, uh, because I still believed, I, I said, oh, you'll be pleased to know that Scientology has exteriorized from the Church of Scientology and you can now get it without the attached mother cult. And he wrote back this wonderful letter. It was the first time I heard from him. He became a good friend over the years. And um, 
He said, I don't believe that Scientology can work outside the fascist environment of the organization, <laughs> which is a fair point. Um, when I came to meet him, and by that time, you know, a few weeks later, I, I'd sort of pretty much stopped believing. And he said to me, it's really weird. He said, it's 14 years since I left Scientology, but still I can be crossing the road and suddenly think to myself, did I just commit an overt? And so, you know, yeah, you can take the Cyril out of Scientology, but can you take the Scientology out of the Cyril? I would expand that because, as you know, it took me better than a decade to shed the absolutely stupid beliefs of my own system. Hmm. It took, I, I left in 1996 and I was still hanging on to some of those beliefs in 2012 and even into 2015 when we met, yeah. which is better than a decade. And the point is that there is no kind of, it's not like a, a natural biological process use the word shed that no i had to pull them out and and look at them and say no this is stupid no this can't happen and also have to deal with people who still did and talk to the people who still did and realize just how stupid destructive and even in some cases abusive the beliefs that i'd settled for were mm. like one particular one we choose our parents which i know scientology also has um it was very very common in the neo-pagan community even after i left my cult and being told that in 2012 and i just turned around and said tell that to joseph fritzel's kids that was who joseph fritzel is because i'm sure that nobody's ever oh known. yes what a bright little ray of sunshine i'm going to be at this point joseph fritzel was an austrian person a man who he decided that he wanted to have his 18-year-old daughter kept in his basement as his second wife. He got her into a built a bunker underneath the house. And this was starting, he started like way before she was 18. And then on her 18th birthday, tricked her into the basement and kept her there for how many years? It was easily quite a long time. Quite a long time. And long enough for her to have him to father seven more children with her and is the point that she chose him as a parent or is the point that their children chose them as parents because you know this could get very complicated but but the idea is that it was some sort of lesson that that soul needed to learn and it's like no you don't need to be brutalized not really to learn the lesson that being brutalized is bad. Yeah. It so what what we end up with, uh, and we are going to get in some detail here. I I I spent 12 years standing up Scientology. Um they had, you know, I don't know, 40,000 members and two billion dollars. I had oh a bicycle and um and a bow tie and not much else and i i don't know how i survived that long with with the onslaught of harassment that came my way but i am very stubborn as you may have noticed over the what nine years we've been working together um despite whinging about the difficulties of life it's quite hard to stop me when I get my teeth into something. And so for 12 years, I kept doing this. I, you know, I did a couple of hundred media pieces, 150 court cases I worked on in that time. And um, it just kept on coming for four years after I kind of went, I just can't do this anymore. I don't have any support. You know, there's, there's no money there, you know, there's very little encouragement. Um, I'd published what is now Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky. I was uh, appointed an expert witness to the High Court in London in 1987 over Russell Miller's book, which, of course, is 
based upon Blue Sky. He had a copy of my manuscript. I worked with him for 18 months on, on that wonderful Barefaced Messiah, wonderful biography of Hubbard. But from the moment I left, the, the problem that it appeared to me was how do you get somebody's thinking out of this? Now, our friend Steve Hassan says, you know, if you were, if you'd been brainwashed, how would you know that you'd been brainwashed? And if we think of it this way, that Scientology is malware. Scientology is the software on which a programmed rondroid, there's a word from the past, will run. It was a very popular word in the 1980s, rondroid. It's very insulting and nasty. You know? um, but it was, it was around. But how, how would you know what was going on? Now, for me, it was very easy that, that uh, having been absolutely a true believer, never, you know, I, I didn't believe in the organization, that's for sure. And I left for two years and to go to art college because that was a lot more fun than St. Hill. And watching a variety of the vixens, as they were later, I later found they were called the women who were running things, wearing jackboots, marching around in military uniforms, did not appeal to me. It's just not part of my erotic sense, you know, um, being shouted at and bullied. Um, so I left St. Hill and I spent a couple of years not doing that until I was talked back in by, yes, Ira Chalef, you know. <laughs> and and so I then headed the renovations of the Manchester organization in Deansgate um, and uh, went and did OT levels and became superhuman and all of that stuff. But I, throughout my nine-year involvement, I believed in Ron Hubbard and I believed in Scientology. And then I worked out that he was a liar, a barefaced messiah. He was somebody who contradicted himself. Now, that's the easiest kind of liar to, to find. And I then found that for nine years, I'd been ignoring those lies. And I started talking to people. And the story I've told often enough, you've heard it often enough, um, was with a woman called Vicky Ballard, who had been the commanding officer of the St. Hill Foundation, the evening and weekend organization. And Vicky at that time was very convinced. She later was reported in the news as how it becoming deeply disillusioned with Scientology, I'm happy to say. But when I put it to her that, that Ron Hubbard had claimed in my philosophy, handwritten 1965 on display at St. Hill, that he was crippled and blinded with physical injuries to hip and back at the end of World War II. I faced a non-existent future abandoned by family and friends, all of that stuff. That that was one account he was giving. He was blind. He was crippled. Uh, the end of the war. And another in a, a professional auditor's bulletin called Communication and Isness, he said that on July the 25th, feeling sorry for himself because he hadn't been posted overseas, he went down to Hollywood and beat up three petty officers. And I put it to her that the end of the war was August the 14th. This is July the 25th. How is it that he was able to do this and somehow in combat between the 25th and the of July and August 14, he had, you know, he was no longer able to see. He was, you know, and Vicky just looked at me and she said he had two bodies. Of course. And she was, she was right. I hadn't thought about that possibility. There's a third thing in uh, November, December 1950 Look magazine where Hubbard says that his war wounds consisted of um, conjunctivitis, pink eye, um, a fall from a ship's ladder, temporary blindness from the flash of a ship's gun, and something wrong with my feet. <laughs> um, so that, and I kind of look at this and go, well, these are contradictory accounts. And while we might accept the parallel universe idea uh, that everything that can possibly happen did happen to Elrond Hubbard, and then he lied about it, that a man who says honesty is sanity. Mm -hmm by his own declaration, is insane. But a man who says the road to truth must be trod with true steps evidently never trod a true step in his life. And at that point, it was, it was confusing, but I was able to say, I don't want to do this anymore until I've thought about it. And thinking about it meant I'm inside it. 
I will use it to think with. And I did. Um, I did the data series evaluators course, um, which is meant to be the, the most successful uh, course on logic and reasoning, what, what, is, what would be called critical thinking by some of our friends. Mm -hmm. um, I did this course, high level course, um in Scientology so I was qualified to reason and um as I looked at Scientology through the lens of the data series course it seemed to me that Scientology was not rational um so for example altered importance is one of the out points if you are to understand something you must have you must be able to prioritize it into the importances of the subject what's the most important material in Scientology when I came to write down the cosmology of Scientology in Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky, I realized I wasn't aware of anywhere where the cosmology was condensed. You had to, so I took the beginning of the factors before the beginning was a cause. And the entire post of the cause was the creation of effect or words to that effect. And then I moved to the first axiom life is basically a static. Uh, in which Hubbard reduces us to nothing <laughs> when you look at it around the way. You know, a life static has no mass, no meaning, no location in space or in time. You're a big zero, friend. Um, and I found that I had to, and I'm kind of going, well, if he was so logical, and this is the most logical subject in the world, then there's something wrong here. There's something badly wrong here. What's more, in the data series itself, I then turned the data series on itself and went, the data series isn't rational. This is meant to be the great course on logic. And at data series 48, the 48th policy letter, we have a policy letter called out of sequence. And somebody do correct me if I'm wrong. It's 40 years probably since I looked at this. But I think it's data series 48, and I think it's called out of sequence. And I'm kind of going, shouldn't this be, the, the data series policies may not be read out of sequence, it tells you. And it's number 48. So shouldn't that be what you read first? Well, what I, what's going through my mind as I'm listening to you here is that a lot of controlling groups have closed systems with circular reasoning, yeah. but this seems to have a broken closed system that doesn't even make sense within itself. For yeah. instance, in my cult, the way that we would describe discrepancies was through the parallel universe. Oh, you heard some me say something different yesterday. Well, it's your fault. You jumped universes. Mm. But that made sense within the logic of the group. The, the logic might have been effed, but it was consistent to itself. It sounds here like the only consistent thing is, as I said before, um, when you said what is what's the uh, one thing is the um, what it, whatever they call it, make money, make more money, make others produce. That seems to me to be the one constant and yeah, most the, important thing. The policy letter, which is called the governing policy of Scientology, no. which. I didn't see as a member, mm -hmm. bearing in mind that, that Hubbard is listed as the most prolific author of all time by the Guinness Book of World Records, that you will perhaps see 2% of the material he wrote on the courses you do, and there's no time to do anything else. So there are all sorts of inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. I was able, you know, in the years after I left Scientology, to find my way through a great deal of material you know, all of the fair game stuff about how you harass people. I'd never seen any of that. But no. It wasn't in any course I did. The courses I did were about how you're nice to people. Well, the um, other thing is that um, one of the most dangerous attachments is, is disorganized attachment. If things don't make sense, even in their own rules, that's a horrific place for your brain to be at. Yeah. So Let's that makes it. it the hardest to get out of in my it would seem yeah, with we, we have to take take a step back there to explain to people what attachment theory is. Oh, of I course, think. of course. And you you can have uh, you know a, a good positive attachment. It it's a theory that that came out of the study of child relationships with children in the nineteen fifties and sixties, um, and it's uh, what's his name John 
Bowlby? No. Bowlby, John Bowlby, uh, followed by uh, Margaret Ainsworth, I think, later. And what they did was there are four kinds of attachment. You have a, a secure attachment, which is the good type. You have, and there are various terms are used for it, but but there's a hostile attachment where, where somebody is horrible to you. There's an indifferent attachment where somebody ignores you, which is thought to be worse for a child than, than having a hostile attachment, you know, a critical attachment. But then there is disorganized attachment and um, friend Alex Stain, who's been on the channel, Professor Alex Stain, um, she was in a, a left-wing cult in America and uh, escaped and uh, wrote a, a lovely book, which there'll be a copy of down here, which is called uh, Terror, Love and Rainwashing. And as a social psychologist, she talks about attachment theory and disorganized attachment is where the, you know, as a child, and I do have questions about how this works with adults. I think we, we're into a very okay. much more complicated subject. But with kids, if you have a parent who says, come here, come here, I love you, slap. That's a disorganized attachment. The person from whom you, you expect love, encouragement and support is also the person who is horrible to you so yeah i think alexandra is is right in saying that generally the attachment that somebody who's in um, an authoritarian group has is a disorganized attachment you get used to being confused all the time being uncertain about uh, the regard in which you're held and about your status within the group um certainly hubbard maintained that he uh built people up and, and knock them down. So I came out with this, you know, I kind of went, okay, I don't believe any of this anymore. And I will now consider it piecemeal bit by bit. And, and, you know, I'd be very happy to um, take back anything that's useful to me. And I expected that I would, I, I really did. When early in 1984, I kind of went, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to believe it anymore. I really thought that there'd be aspects of Scientology that were useful to me. There aren't. And coming to that, after nine years of being a true believer and saying, well, actually, Hubbard himself said that the original source or the genus, he misused that word when talking about this, the original source of material is that will usually be the better source in a paper which we've read out on this channel called Possible Origins for Dianetics and Scientology. I don't know how I come up with these snappy titles, really. But um, I took the work that Jeff Jacobson had done before, where he'd shown that certain ideas that Hubbard was using could be found in earlier sources. I extended that. And I then said, but I want to, to prove that Hubbard knew these sources. And I think in all, I got to 120 ideas in Scientology that I could source to other places and that Hubbard referenced. So Hubbard talked about Alistair Crowley. And in Alistair Crowley, you have the trauma of birth. Um, you also have the use, rather than metempsychosis or reincarnation, you have past lives. Um, it's a trivial thing. But you also have the what's called beginner's training routine zero, where you sit with your eyes closed. Crowley used that. In fact, Crowley was the main source, about half of those 120 ideas. And Hubbard talks about him, uh, calls him his, his very good or his very dear friend, very good friend, I think, in one of his 1952 Philadelphia doctorate course lectures. Mm. Um, so I traced down these ideas and said, well, this is where it came from. And I agree with him. Going to the person who came up with the idea that he'd taken, they generally had a you know a, a better view than he did. So I find myself this many years later not actually believing in anything that's you know significant in Scientology. And he himself sometimes talks about the origin. So, for example, um, he talks about the origin of what he calls the cycle of action, which isn't in fact a cycle because it doesn't repeat misunderstood word on his part. It's a sequence of action, let's call it that, which is start, change, stop, which he says comes from the Vedic literature. It goes that far back that people had noticed that things begin, go along and end. 
what an observation that is and how useful. So I found that it wasn't useful to me, but I had conversations with hundreds of Scientologists over the years uh, following that. And I found that it was really hard to shift their beliefs that logic and evidence wasn't going to do it. Then, of course, I encountered Leon Festinger's work on cognitive dissonance, uh, which was, in fact, the first experimental proof of it or experimental, the first study, um, which becomes uh, the book When Prophecy Fails. That, in fact, the woman at the center of that, who was part of a, a space cult, that they believed that the mothership was going to come and get them from a hilltop. What What is not properly underline is that she was a Scientologist and she had a live-in Scientology auditor back then in 1950, whenever it was. Um, so, you know, even there, Scientology involved. But what Festinger predicted was that the people who really believed would continue believing after the prophecy failed, just as millions of Jehovah's Witnesses have year in, year out, and it's now more than a century since the world was meant to end in 1914, I believe, was the first prophecy. Uh, if anybody's uh, waiting for it, I think 2033 is their next predicted Armageddon, uh, but they don't publish that in their literature anymore. That's that's a bit of a secret. They've learned uh, not to do that uh, since 1975 caused such a uh you know, an Orwellian stir of, are you ready for 1975 printed right in their magazines? And then everybody going, well, it didn't end. And, oh, well, you guys were the ones who predicted that. We didn't. We just went along with you. That's because we prayed and it happened in a parallel universe. Mm -hmm. and, and he had two bodies, um, yeah. maybe three. You know, who knows how many bodies he had. And the dog ate many... my Armageddon. That's it. The dog ate my Armageddon. Um, there's the a school. title for you yeah thank you so much for that um, it's, um, it's it, um, I think it's Stalin Ate My Homework was Alexi Sales first part of his biography and then Thatcher Stole My Trousers was the second so you know something to it and now he's a Putin supporter what what do you do when, when your most brilliant comedian joins uh that particular faction um not very much really there's not very much you can do no it bewildered me the willingness that people have to continue believing something now it took me seven years before i could confidently sit with anybody that believed this stuff and get them to think about it it's not something you can do remotely. You can't do it through a book. You can't do it even through a lovely video like this one necessarily, because what you're going to have to deal with is somebody's confirmation bias. That can't be true because it does. it's not what I already believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, also called my side bias. But, so what I already have as experience must be true. You then have to deal with the cognitive dissonance, that feeling of confusion and dizziness that comes over us when our beliefs are contradicted. And also what we want to believe. Mm. There was a lot of wishful thinking in my beliefs. And as you were saying, you can't sit with people. I had a very dear friend that I have had to distance myself from because she still is very much into the beliefs and now that we don't believe the same thing, it's very hard for us to have any kind of conversation whatsoever. When the human genome was finally tracked out and I had to face the fact that, no, my blue eyes did not come from elves as I had maintained in my beliefs. I had always said, no, blue has, eyes are from Fae. They're not human has, trait. Have, have, has the DNA of elves actually been properly tested though uh you know, do well, we have the elf genome well the thing is that it's all strictly this planet from humans yada 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 there's no 
And I said, well, I'm going to have to give up that belief because it's been scientifically debunked. I am 100% human for better or for worse. Her response was, no, I don't believe that because they say something I disagree with. That was word for word what she said. I mean, and, and to be fair, we aren't completely human. Uh, we have um, Denisovan genes, uh, some of us, and yeah. Neanderthal genes. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, elves, I, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Fiorensis, there, there could be a few Fiorensis genes around as well. But you know, nobody it's... from another planet, nobody. Well, as far as we know. Yeah, but that, okay. But fair enough, but the idea of I'm not going to believe this because I disagree with the outcome because I'd rather believe in the fairy tale. And and let's get right to it, Semmelweis. When Semmelweis went to other doctors and said, I think you need to wash your hands before you deliver babies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he was ridiculed. The other doctors knew that they could come from doing an autopsy and then deliver a baby without... and childbed fever was just normal and that so many women died from it and so many infants died well that was just nature the fact that not so many had died under the care of um, midwives is is quite interesting but the doctors because they're doctors they know about this i mean i had a i'm going to say this because it's true a couple of months ago i had a, a medical doctor insist insist the conversation came back and he said at the second time that you can cause permanent brain damage with a single use of cannabis he insisted and it, it's a subject that's been of serious interest to me because prohibition as a general subject has been of serious in interest to me since i was a teenager when we prohibit alcohol or prohibit drugs what will happen and so i've read a lot of literature in the last year I've read three books that are talking about cannabis and and its medical or your know, properties otherwise and I'm skeptical I'm skeptical in all directions but nonetheless seeing the invention of material that somebody you're going to go well this person's an authority this guy's a doctor he must know what he's talking about and you kind of go can you point to a study that that says this because I ain't seen one. I've seen the allegation made many times about cannabis psychosis. Um, it was made in the 1880s and led to the India Hemp Drugs Commission, which was the largest study of drugs ever undertaken. And they interviewed, I think it was 500 people who had cannabis psychosis. And they determined that not one of them had cannabis psychosis. In fact, they determined more than half of them had never used cannabis. But when the Indian police picked somebody up on the streets who was acting crazy, they said, cannabis psychosis. They did the, di the diagnostic. Mm -hmm. The same thing came up in Egypt. Uh, in 1923, they proposed to the League of Nations that cannabis be made illegal because it was driving people crazy. And the head of asylums uh, in Egypt was uh, didn't speak Arabic. Egypt was a, a British mandate pretty much a colony. And so he'd not interviewed anybody. And from there, oh, I'm on a roll now, 1924, a book called The Black Candle, uh, published under the name Janie Canuck, uh, who was in fact a Canadian a juvenile magistrate um, or magistrate in juvenile cases. I don't think she was herself juvenile, uh, though her attitudes were. And she said that if white women were given cannabis, they would want to miscegenate have sex with black men and uh, this would sully the purity of the white race and that's what made cannabis illegal in canada in 1924 um, they have repented since and were the second country in the world to legalize cannabis um, i don't know how the white women in canada feel about that you know but hey you know let's have some coffee colored babies between us it's all good um, so People will accept a certain authority and they'll say this is true. Now, how would you know if Scientology was still acting upon how you, you behave? Let's take Scientology's own fundamental, foundational idea. And this is the idea put forward in Dianetics, the modern science of mental health, 
fundamental science of modern health, however you think about it, in 1950, that the human mind is a calculator. Now, he uses the word computer, but he actually means a calculator because he talks about a held down number, mm -hmm. either a five or a seven, depending which of his accounts you read. And the idea is that we can't add stuff up in our heads because there's a number being added into all calculations. Well, here we go. This is what Scientology is doing. It's adding information into your calculations about the world, and you don't know it's doing it. Yeah. How would you know? How do you come to know? Well, this is it. It it's a subject. You know, it it. I I left this thing in 1996. I got sick and tired of being steamrolled with harassment and litigation and rumor campaigns and people. You know, ringing up my friends and going we found out some really interesting things and all of this stuff saying I was a heroin addict or a, a rapist or, you know, all of these phenomenally stupid stories that were being spread around. And many of them believed. I still meet people who've come out of Scientology who, who think I, I was a heroin addict. I've never taken heroin in my life. As for, I've never actually seen any of this stuff, you know. So it, it's, it's fabulism. It's invention. It's nastiness. And by 1996, after 12 years of doing this without any support, I just went, I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm crazy. And I stopped. And from January 96 through till October 2012, I made no public comment about Scientology. And a friend of mine, uh, Jill Robinson, who was a TV producer, who was at that time making The Big Question, or The Big Questions, I don't even remember, actually, said, would I come on the show? And I'm going, oh, no, they'll harass me if I come on the show. We'll start again. And I went on and I uh, explained OT3 to an audience of a, of a couple of million people, which was, you know, was good. And then I waited and nothing happened. <laughs> no harassment, not even a legal letter. So, I went, oh, I put my toe in the water and there are no sharks there. Uh, that's unusual. And then something else happened. I met somebody um, who's still a good friend of mine who had grown up in Scientology. And she said, and you know this story well enough by now. She said, um, is reality really an agreement? As Elrond yeah. Hubbard said. Mm -hmm. And my response was, yes, if you're the hypnotist. Uh, otherwise, no, that the universe is real, whether you want it to be or not, whatever you think about it. The next week, she came back, and to anybody who's familiar with me, you've probably heard this story. She said she'd used scented laundry conditioner, fabric conditioner. And we both knew what she meant. She'd broken a taboo, which is inflicted upon members of the C organization in Scientology called the hygiene hat, the training in hygiene, which is that you are absolutely forbidden, verboten, from using anything scented, mm -hmm. shampoo, soap, anything, no fragrances though, because Hubbard had scent phobia. Uh, so did Rajneesh, curiously. I, you know, and if, if there are followers of any other gurus who know about a scent phobia, this would be quite interesting if this heightened sensitivity to, to smells will incline you towards temporal lobe epilepsy and therefore <laughs> having to be a cult leader. Mine didn't, but he did. He didn't like loud noises that he wasn't responsible for. He, he does shout and scream frankly. and bang things. But if a loud noise happened, I remember dropping a book in a bookstore, and that set him off on an entire day of I'd done something horrible because I'd hmm. made this loud noise. So you should have explained that you did it in a parallel universe, and he shouldn't have gone. Why there. didn't I think of it? Anyway. Yeah. I'm not keen on, on loud noises. I saw Black Sabbath once and my ears were ringing for a week afterwards. That, that was enough of that, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, so what had happened was that we hadn't talked about this at all. And yet here she was, that she had challenged the teaching. Now here's the nub of the thing. But if you want to find out if you are still under the influence of Scientology, then... Think about the ideas of Scientology. Rather than just thinking you can walk away, 
pick up a copy of, uh, I don't know, History of Man. That's a good one. Or uh, Problems of Work or Fundamentals of Thought. Read what the man says and see if you still agree with it. And what I've found with people is that once that process is started, once they can, you know, it's okay to say this is nonsense. It's okay to say this is a contradiction. It's okay to say this doesn't make sense. And when you've, it's kind of you've moved yourself in position from being underneath the person and under their control to claiming equality, saying I'm allowed to think about things. I'm allowed to make decisions. So, again, I've told this story often enough, but I'll tell it again. I came to a formulation for this ultimately oh, in about 1993, in the last century, many years ago. And I sat in a room where there were 12 of us, all of us having been involved with Scientology, more than 200 years between us in Scientology. And I said, let's discuss the principle of Scientology. And first off, let's go around the room, starting from my left. I'm not going to start uh, because I have too much influence as it is. Um, so let's, rather than me leading the conversation, let somebody tell me, everybody talk about an experience they had using the eight dynamics, uh, where they use the eight dynamics of Scientology to solve a problem. And the eight dynamics, fundamentally, Hubbard said, there are eight urges to survival. You start with the urge, the first dynamic, the self. The second dynamic is the family and sexual activity. Um, the third dynamic is any groups you belong to. The fourth dynamic is mankind. And then you go on up through matter, energy, space, and time, spirits, other life forms, and God or infinity. You don't want to believe in God. So you've got these eight dynamics and you've got this sciencey sounding formulation that that you can um, basically make a decision by voting across the eight dynamics. So it's good for me, so I, that gets one vote. It's good for the missus, that gets another vote. It's good for the cricket club or in America, baseball club perhaps, that gets another vote. Um, may not be good for mankind, but sod them. There are only 8 million of them. It's good for rocks, matter, energy, space, and time. I don't know why they get a vote, but they do. It's nice. Let's include everybody. And it's good for other life forms. And therefore, that's six votes out of eight. So God and mankind, who cares? Now, this does not work, but I didn't realize just how badly it does not work. First person in the, in the group says, never tried to use it to solve a problem. And it's meant to be a way of assessing problems. Two and one, 200 years experience on toilet. Second person, never tried. Third, there was nobody in the room who was willing to say that they had ever tried to solve a problem using this device. It was then easy to say, well, how on earth can you have a system that gives me a vote and the other 8 billion human beings won vote. This does not make any sense at all. I'm wondering, because Scientology has called itself an applied applied spiritual system? A technology of science. Yeah. A modern but, science of mental health. But I have heard from you and others that they just never used or applied a lot of the ideas that's like almost like having a toolbox where you only use the screwdriver and the monkey wrench just sits at the bottom being with cobwebs on it. Would you well, say is that fair assessment? If, well, you could put it that way as a metaphor to say that, that you're offered all sorts of um, ideas that are meant to be fundamental fundamentals of thought for example in in hubbard's uh, collected writings but when you actually get in close to these things they're like tissue paper mm -hmm. i pretty usually from you know the eight dynamics this is a nonsense this is not actually useful in any way shape or form in terms of um rationally solving problems it, it just doesn't make any sense because you know, all of the groups you might belong to get one vote between them. And one would like to think, you know, that 
you know, the, the girl guides could have their own vote and the, um, the uh, elks could have their vote and, you know, whatever. But it, it's, it's something sciency. It's to make it look as if you've got a rational and scientific system when what you've actually got are a bunch of opinions which are actually often in contradiction to one another, which makes it kind of complicated. Now, Hubbard, somewhere, and, and please, if there's somebody watching this, I have talked with so many people over the years asking this question. There is somewhere that Hubbard says, and I thought it was in the false data stripping uh, material, it isn't, and I can't find it. There is somewhere where Hubbard says that if you give somebody contradictory information, from the same source, they will be unable to make a decision and they will do what you tell them to do. They will follow orders because they're confused. And I, Scientology is about that. There's so much of it. So we have you know, a simple statement. Owen Hubbard said, absolutes are unobtainable. That, by the way, is an absolute statement. Yeah, that's a contradiction in, in itself. It's like the following sentence is true, the previous sentence is false. Yeah. Or um, what is it? It's the exception that proves the rule, um, which, which, of course, is a mistranslation of the Latin original, which translated properly as the exception tests oh, the rule. Yes, yes, yes. Now, do you think that's on purpose or do you think it's just because he was a different person, not a different person every day? but in a different frame of mind every day. Like I will write something very passionately one day, go back to it the next day and go, what kind of mood were you in? Well, if you look, when I did the solo auditor course where you learn how to hold two tin cans in one hand. Um, I do that shopping all the time. There, there you go. You, 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 would you like to attest? Uh, um Rice yes. success story. I, I will take the two cans of tomato tomato sauce for 89 cents you, each. You've got to keep them separate with these two fingers on one of them, these two on the other, oh. so that oh. so that it, it'll read on the e-meter. Well, that's, that's um, what your receipt is for. Well, there you go. So on this course, the solo auditors course, there is a bulletin which says that some idiot has introduced the rule that you do not call a floating needle unless it is between 2 and 3.5 on the tone arm. The next bulletin is where the idiot said it, and the idiot was Ron Hubbard. <laughs> so I have the idea that either through his use of drugs, and he did admit he actually advocated, frequently advocated in 5051, the use of amphetamines, if you have to grab hold of anything, grab hold of Benzedrine. It's right there in Dianetics, Modern Science and Mental Health, in talking about the use of amphetamines. It's something that Scientologists with their anti-drug thing now can't see anymore because, as Ron Hubbard said, when you become too incredible, you become invisible. Cognitive dissonance means that we don't tend to register the things that disagree with our fixed view of things. So... Yeah, where Hubbard talks about alcohol being the most dangerous drug in society in Dianetics and Modern Science of Mental Health and cannabis probably being the safest, which is an interesting thought in 1950. Uh, he calls it marijuana. Um, you know, this is somewhat in contradiction to Narcanon and, and, you know, saving the world in this way. He also, in a lecture and uh, the references in the paper I wrote called Never Believe a Hypnotist, which is also on, read out on this channel somewhere, that he talked about having made himself a guinea pig in an experiment to see how hard it was to come off a phenobarbital, barbiturates. And this confirms his medical records that he took a huge amount of barbiturates um, towards the end of his Navy service, um, meant to be to deal with an ulcer, but I think he had something else going on there. This, these are downers. This is a very strong sedative drug, the barbiturate. Uh, very rarely used these days because of the terrible addictions that it caused and the, mm -hmm. um, it stops you sleeping. You fundamentally just go into coma states instead of sleeping. It's, it's a dreadful drug. So depending used. on which drug he was on, it would have been a different L. Ron Hubbard each day. 
uppers and downers and the 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 record is there to you know not only did he admit to the use of both of those drugs but we also have um what his his son Elron Hubbard Jr uh said and and we do have to take everything that Nibs Hubbard said with a pinch, pinch of salt i have taken that pinch of salt um hubbard used uppers and downers at the same time and that induces a, a quite other state uh, out of which we get operating thetan level three, um, where he's mixing together his uh, pinks and greys to to get this this effect. Um, again, I have that confirmed by the woman who who visited him at his request and got him off the drugs in Gran Canaria at the end of 1966. This, this is not just speculative on my part. I have actually done a fair amount of work to to get to this so we have somebody who is taking mind-altering substances um but he also as Yuval Loor pointed out uh, when we were in Toronto in 2015 having fun there he also very 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 likely had temporal lobe epilepsy and that leads uh, well worth looking at the Berfedio checklist the 18 points in there when Yuval brought them to me in Toronto I ticked 17 of them immediately Mm -hmm. The top one being hypographia, can't stop writing. The man who's credited as the most prolific author of all time, I think we can tick that one. But there's a kind of religiosity as well. There's a sense of self-importance that can come with this condition. And this this is not to condemn people who have temporal lobe epilepsy. Oh, no. Because Hubbard was also um, sociopathic. He was also nasty you know let's get down underneath the real condition of the man he was also abusive manipulative and we can find that throughout his life from his teens onward the way that he exploited people you know that stole thirty-five thousand dollars of jack parsons money for example in 1946 was convicted of fraud check fraud in 1948 um when he died his fingerprints were were tested against the prints that were taken for that check fraud. So that kind of proved it both ways in San Luis Obispo, if anybody wants to get the records. I was thinking um, because of the bringing it back to the how do you know if you've still got a bit of Scientology in you, is that one of the other things that happens is the cloning of the individual to be like their copy, their idea of the leader. And so if a person is still calling out enemies everywhere, seeing enemies everywhere, contradicting themselves, doing L. Ron Hubbard stuff, then they've still got a bit of L. Ron Hubbard in them because I've noticed a lot of the time, and I'm not going to name names or anything, that a lot, of, a lot of the people bless their hearts, even the ones who I consider good, wonderful people still will sometimes get into these this person said something I disagree with. Thus, they are an enemy. They are an SP. They are a well, person. The word, yeah. word sociopath, psychopath, yeah. narcissist, borderline, yeah. Yeah. whichever psychiatric w will be the label rather than uh, even antisocial personality, which both psychiatry and Hubbard use. They will use a, a psychiatric term instead rather of... Yeah. yeah, and of course, sometimes it will be true. Sometimes it will be true. There are psychopaths in the world. Oh, yes, like about three percent of men and one percent of women. Um, so about two percent of the overall population. People who have no conscience, and of course, we have talked to some length about these as human predators, and the psychopath is one of the forms of human predator. Mm -hmm. Um, but that sort of yeah, black and white thinking, polarization, all or nothing. You're with us or against us. You you know, simplifying things down in those terms. But the the danger of this is quite simple. If you don't take Scientology out of the girl or out of the boy or out of the transgender person, um, then it's still in there. Mm. And you know, our sense of identity is wrapped up in what we believe. Um, I think it's the Bhagavad Gita, as you believe, so you are. 
And that's worth thinking about whatever you believe. You know, if one is utterly convinced of certain things, if we look historically at the witch trials mm -hmm. during the 16th, 17th and into the 18th centuries, where certainly more than 10,000 people were executed for having what Scientology would call OT powers. They were executed for having magical abilities. Also, it was presumed whenever we look at one of these cases, say the Pendle case, which was quite famous here, the Salem Witch Trials, or Loudin, um, and Aldous Huxley's Devils of, of Loudin is, is a remarkable book. And the movie The Devils by uh, Ken Russell, designed by Derek Jarman, is a real insight into this mass sociogenic illness where a whole group of people come to believe something absolutely lunatically crazy. This still happens. It happens all over the world, and groups of people are still susceptible to it. Um, we're all potentially susceptible to it, um, given the right or the wrong conditions. When we see the fervor that swept the Italian people under Mussolini, which would then be carried through to German speakers by Hitler and his cronies, and we get to this point where was it in 1938, I think, after the union with Austria, the Anschluss, um, Hitler decides he's going to have the last election. He's going to have a vote to decide whether he should be Führer or not. And more than 90% of German speakers, and I don't believe this election was rigged in any way, decided they didn't want the right to vote something they'd only got after the Versailles Treaty anyway, because the German states were not democracies. They were part of a, of a Reich, of an empire. And the Germans decided they didn't want that right. Um, they didn't want to be able to decide. They didn't want to choose. They wanted this, this man of highly restricted education to be the boss and to make the decisions uh, in other words, they wanted to be in a child state and have a parent to tell them what to do. Want and... somebody to give us the answers, mm. the easy answers, and figure it all out. Yeah. And rather than accepting that, that we don't have the answers and we have to go with what's probable in the world and what's possible in the world, rather than inflicting ourselves upon it. But the history of humanity is a history of tyranny. It's a his history of um horrors um and unfortunately underneath those horrors people who believe absurdities may commit atrocities um radha krishnan the second premier of india we're not going to mention voltaire at all see see how we got away with that i was just thinking the uh, i mean for a while i lived in a bit of a little corner of the bible belt and a lot of people there I have no problem with what Cousin Jesus said. I, I, I wish more people would actually take a look at what he said rather than the, I must give up my life and let Jesus take the wheel. And the ultimate, I think I've told, I think I've told this story before how I was taking a Red Cross course. And one of the things that you, you did was you had a little checkoff list and one of, the, one of the boxes you had to tick was, I take responsibility for my life. And one of the women I was taking the course with refused to tick that box because no, I have agreed to give all my responsibility to Jesus Christ, our Lord and savior. One word. Going 90, I ain't scary because I've got the Virgin Mary. Three rod, yeah. no. The dashboard of my car. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> right. Or, or as a, a friend of mine was, um, his girlfriend was driving a little fast, and um, they were both Scientologists. And, and he said, "Could you slow down a bit?" And she just looked at him and said, "You're not PTS, are you? This idea that anything that happens to you is the will of God or or when some something that you've made happen." When I was uh, I was driving home with uh, the guy that I had been married off to, and on the way home, we saw 
a barbecue on a port in, in Burlington here. We have these beautiful old 19th century houses and there was a barbecue pit that was obviously flaming and I wanted to stop and say, hey, your barbecue part of the pit is about to set your whole porch on fire. Mm. He would not let me stop because it was the universe and I would be interfering with their karma if I... Yeah, I, I had a dear friend, and let's celebrate her, Shiona Fox Ness. She was a marvel and a wonder, and we all loved her dearly. And sadly, she's gone now, um, 30 years ago, I think. And uh, but she was great to be around. And by the time I met her, she'd actually worked in the personal office of Aaron Hubbard, which meant she'd never met him, <laughs> personal office, but uh, with Laurel Sullivan, and uh, Jerry Armstrong was around in those days. And um, she came to me one day and she said, John, why are you wasting your life helping Scientologists? They've pulled it in. And so I said to her, Shiona, a four-year-old is just about to go in front of a bus. Do you stop the four-year-old? Because I would. And... You know, a comment that was made by Arthur Kersler, and it's, you know, who is a, not necessarily the nicest man in the world, but he was very smart. And he wrote a very interesting book called The Lotus and the Robot, because his friends were, this is in the 50s, his friends were getting involved with Daisette Suzuki, who would influence my hero, Eric Fromm, I'm afraid to say. And Suzuki was a war criminal and brought Zen to the West. He was a supporter of the extermination of, of Chinese people during the uh, the glory days of the Japanese Imperial Army. That did not come out until the 1990s. But so you've got Daisset Suzuki along with Alan Watts, the lapsed Anglican vicar, bringing this stuff in. And you've got also Aurobindo and various Indian sages bringing this stuff in. And what will become the hippie culture, the beat culture, is, is long. Aldous Huxley is a great mate of Kersler's. And Kersler's, oh, this is so clever. Why is he taken in by this? So he decided he'd go to India and Japan and see how these religious beliefs applied in these countries. And the Lotus and the Robot is his report. In India, he says, and, and I'd say this was in the 50s, that I believe he says 98% of charities in India mm. are operated by Christians because in the Hindu philosophy, you don't, You've got karma. It's like people are living through their 80, 84,000 lifetimes or what have you to, to reach this elevated state. You mustn't interfere. So the idea of charity, caritas, is not necessarily to be found there. And in a culture that, you know, to be fair, had been devastated uh, by the British. Um, and it's, you know, brilliant philosophical formulations had come down to this, that people are just saying, well, it's, it's karma vipaka, it's action and reaction. And what happens to you is your own fault. There is no place for compassion in, in such a system. And I am not saying that Hindus are not compassionate. Of course, Hindus can be compassionate. The problem is if you go along with that particular argument of saying, I mustn't interfere, I must let the world go to hell, yeah. um, then you know, you can't really claim any superiority if, if that's your way. So the, the thought is, until you're willing to ask the question, and this can go in the trailer, until you're willing to ask the question, am I still influenced by the beliefs of Scientology? Then you are influenced by the beliefs of Scientology. You have to be I think, able to look at the unquestionable assumptions in your life. What is it that I dare not think about? What is it that's too frightening? Yeah. And I would say, having traveled that quite long road now at the age of 69, I am more settled in, in my life than I've ever been. I'm happier than I have been since I was four years old. 
and the buggers sent me to school, which was a very bad idea. It didn't do me any good. Um, and that is largely because I believe what I choose to believe. And I challenge myself all the time about what it is I believe and what I'm willing to believe. And I find that not believing what Elron Hubbard said and being able to check things and test them as he said we are meant to do, that I actually end up, have ended up a happier person. And I think that if you've got stuff running in your head that's in conflict and contradiction, whether it's some puritanical nonsense that that comes from some guru, you know, some Larry Ray figure who who basically wants to dominate and destroy you, or some political cult. And I'm sad to say that all of our political parties are cults. That's you know, they they are dishonorable, a lot of them. With or some even just the very, whole very nation, the whole nation. There's this whole whole wonk and i'm i i don't know if it hum, comes in other ones but i have had to de- i've i have had to deal I'm, I'm sure other people have where it's basically we are the greatest we are the best and you have to and there's all these unquestionable assumptions of that are thought stopping cliches freedom isn't free um these people died to keep us free these are and it's like well how did they did they i'm willing to hear but did they actually you know did uh did going over in iraq and from the 1990s to whatever did that actually keep me any more or less free than i am now did it keep you any less safe than you are now it most certainly did but that the security of the world has been severely affected by the Afghan and Iraqi incursions. And no, I was a little afraid just to say that because I am related to people who take that as a matter of religious faith, even though all my family's atheist. That's the faith you've got. It, to... it, it's conviction. Yeah. And that when we you know i i like to think that anybody can challenge me on on my views as long as they're reasonably polite about it mm. if they start deciding that they can talk down to me then i might very well take them on because i'm not as nice as i look um and i don't look very nice so um it's it's possible you know somebody challenges my assumptions about life, the universe and everything, I do not feel emotionally affected. Uh, a great book, um, Straight and Crooked Thinking by Robert Thulas, uh, as edited by his grandson, Christopher Thulas. There is a lot of talk about critical thinking and I am very hesitant about this term. I don't think it means anything. I think it. it we used to have rationality, logic, reasoning, um, critical thinking, it isn't an actual subject. Um, and there is a point in Thulas's book uh, where he explains, if you feel emotionally triggered by your views being challenged, then you need to think again. Mm. If it makes you emotional, then you are not in a, a state of pure reason and you're not objective. And so being able to challenge our views have our views challenged i have friends who are christians I, i'm an agnostic i don't believe in that stuff i stopped believing in the christian god when i was 13 i just did that's what happened i've never felt like going back to it it's never seemed real to me um that's the way i am however i have friends who are christians and a, a couple of very close friends who are mm -hmm. christians do i fight with them about what they believe no do I talk with them about what they believe? Yes. I have other friends who are Christians where if I mention anything that might challenge their view, we get emotion. Mm. And I think, you know, while it's right to, to feel emotional, if, if virtue is challenged, uh, if there is some offense to humanity, if, if something uncompassionate is being suggested, mm -hmm. the, the idea that yeah, you, know, you can come along and say, well, did Jesus have a dual nature? 
which is the duophysite argument in theology. Did he have the nature of a human and the nature of God together? Or was he monophysite? Did he have a single nature? Mm -hmm. You go, well, yeah, let's talk about that. Okay. In the Byzantine Empire, you were quite likely to have your nose chopped off for saying the wrong thing about what kind of nature Jesus had. And I'm going to go... I don't think Jesus would have been too worried about any of that stuff. I think he'd been worried about the, the nose bit. That's the bit I think he'd been bothered by. I would think if he was a historical figure and represented as I've seen him represented in the Bible, he probably would have, would have sat down, listened to you, and then told you a parable that would have summed up what his opinion was on it. Yeah. He'd or, had a, he had a discussion, that, you know, when... Um, you know, it's Peter, isn't it, who chops off the soldier's ear and um, Jesus sticks it back on and says, no, you, you don't want to do that when he's arrested. Yeah. Um, there's a, a degree of violence going on. So, but it, it's really that that thing of if you feel emotionally disturbed with, by the suggestion that you might still be a Scientologist, then you are. And you need to think about it. You need to get beyond it because oh, I don't like to say this, but Scientology is an illness. It's a thing that makes people irrational, makes them um, emotive and passionate and aggressive. Um, you know, what was it the person called me in the comments? Uh, what kind of loser was I? Um a pathetic loser a pathetic I loser With which is to say and you're pathetic i'm a loser and i'm pathetic I didn't even, uh, youtube actually pulled that and said this is not because we can't say anything now well <laughs> yeah which leads us to cancel culture which is a is a is a another topic about puritanism and what we are and aren't, aren't allowed to think or feel and and away I'll we go right now you insult john i'm just gonna i i don't you can disagree but don't insult john yeah <clears throat> my friend and i don't like people who insult people well but i'm friends with them. no it's, it's absolutely wrong and bad and terrible so um we might well have more to say about this um you never know yeah. but and you know, I'd, what I'd really, I'd really like if if there's somebody who believes in Scientology, um, who would like to debate me, uh, politely. I did record such a conversation um, oh. with one of the um, meta psychologists, the followers of um, yeah. Dr. Frank Sarge Gabodi, yeah. and the guy. Um, oh, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. He's on the, on their board. This guy, and very smart guy. Uh, this is a couple of years back now. And he said um, he didn't want me to record at my end because he needed permission to see if they could broadcast the conversation. Thanks. And it was it was so nice to discuss these ideas with somebody really smart and go, yeah, well, that's wrong because of this. And that's wrong because of that. And I never heard from him again. We'd had a few conversations up until that point, but I'm presuming that Sarge Gabodi didn't give permission yeah. for this to be broadcast and now where are we if that's if that's our situation you know that we we mustn't talk about it in case somebody finds an error in our thinking or judgment well also i think maybe you just lost the recording maybe i'm being really unfair yes. here. well it's also just i think that even outside of scientology we have forgotten how to be civil in our disagreements Invective readily takes the, the place of argument and um, it's it's not going to get us anywhere. That asking people to do some soul searching. You know, I would love to see groups of ex-members coming together and discussing the principles of the belief system. You know, a group of Rajneeshis or Scientologists or what have you sitting down and as i say you know this was my experience i i used the arc triangle to solve this problem i used the tone scale to understand this and we might find something useful in that discussion but i think for the most part what we'd find is confusion we'd find contradiction and confusion mm. i was just about to say i think that 
um, some of the XJWs do this very well, actually. Hmm. They will discuss some of the beliefs and say, well, this is wrong because X, X, Y, Z and, and whatever. And Are this... they discussing the, the factuality or whether it whether it's within scripture? Because that's, yeah, that's, that's it, not that's, really where I want yeah. to go with this. No, no. Oh, but that's contradicted by Axiom 47. You know, that it's, yeah. is this true? Is this palpable? Is this tangible? Can we prove that's, it? That's true. Yeah. Because yeah. I do feel that sometimes that's at least a little bit of a step because then they can see the contradictions within and then move back and move on to the whether or not it's true. Yeah, we're not talking about that. No. You know, that, that, that's it, it. Whether it will lead on to that, I, I've not seen that in Bible groups. They okay. tend to be forever discussing which scripture is superior to which other scripture rather than saying, um, you know, if we practice an eye for an eye, then the whole world will soon be blind. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and looking at the logic of these things, or rather than, you know, looking at um, the book of Joshua and saying, do you really want to believe in a God who ordered genocide? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. I'd stand up against that. And I don't care if I get squashed and sent to hell because I wouldn't want to be in heaven with somebody who is horrible. And of course, I'm not suggesting for a moment that, that people who believe in God all believe that. But when you start believing that, when you start justifying that and saying, this is the way it has to be because it says, Ron Hubbard says, or the Bible yeah. says, rather than this is the way to do it because it makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Let's, let's have some sense okay. made. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, let's um, wind that up for the moment. And um, thanks to anybody who's managed to get all the way through this. Um, I'm horrified to say that uh, Lad Bible, I now have a video there that's got 410,000 views. Mm -hmm. So why don't we have that kind of... <laughs> because we're not Lad Bible, that's why. Um, but start watching the videos twice, you know, get our numbers up, do something. Recommend them to a friend. Recommend them to a friend. Right, thank you very much indeed for your, your time and attention, ladies and gentlemen girls, boys, and um, small furry creatures from Alpha Centauri. And um, we'll see you again. This is Spike, and this is John saying goodbye. Thanks so much. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. We can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.